guest on the phone. Right. So, oh, yeah. So this is very interesting method of doing this. <laughs> okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the Critical Blast Cavern. Uh, we're getting a little bit of a different view tonight as we're trying some new technical experience stuff. Mm -hmm. And our wonderful guest, uh, animation legend John Celestri, has uh, been serving as a tech guru tonight. How are you doing, yes. John? How are you doing, RJ? Yes. Hey, listen, you do everything, right? You know, we're all one-person bands. That This is true. Very true at all. Um, and and th th the ironic part is my day job is IT. Boy, I got to find a way to get that <laughs> side camera okay. hooked up to where I'm, look I'm looking at me and not the ceiling. You know what? Forget about it. Y'all are going to look at some beams. Yeah, there's a lot of beams here, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my secretary has shown up. He's going to take notes. I'm uh, going to take notes for my dad. Yeah, okay. You're not looking cool. at that camera anymore. You're looking at that camera. You're right. So, so this is Mr. John Celestri. He does animation. Hi, for, Mr. Celestri. Hi. He, he does animation for cartoons wow. like He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. That is really cool. <laughs> so, you take all the notes. Make I sure will. that I keep keep good records here, okay? I, will. I definitely will. And sometime tonight, as people show up, we are going to randomly give away a copy of Frozen 2. Oh, cool. Uh, with which you had nothing to do, but it's yes. animation. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm old school. You know, that's one of the things I did want to talk to you about, too, was the old school animation. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't know what something happened in animation within the last 20 years. Yeah. And I can't quite put my finger on it because we were given tools that made animation easier. I mean, you, all of a sudden you had this flash animation where you're like, show us where it starts, show us where it stops and let the computer figure out how to get you from A to B. Uh, which sounded good because we got scenes like Beauty and the Beast uh, in that dancing library scene. But all of a sudden we've gone from that to Adventure Time and regular show and mm -hmm. these moving blobs. Um, do you have any appear, any uh, opinion on that? Well, the difference is that that uh, with uh, between 1975 when I broke in, you know, in uh, with uh, Tubby the Tuba, uh, and uh, I was at, at New York Tech, and that's where computer animation really got started there. That we uh, uh, there was a school, it was it was, it was a school in uh, in New York at a college in uh, uh, on Long Island in New York, and Dr. Alexander Shore was uh, it was an animation uh, not any, but he ran the school. And so he wanted to know how to make computer animation and animated films. Okay. And out of that process, out of, out of the studies that they did there for about three years, that's what Photoshop, uh, all of the stuff that came out of, uh, industrial light and magic, which became, um, uh, what is it? Uh, um, Lucasfilm. LucasArts. Uh, uh, was it, um, oh, geez, um, that, that did uh, uh, Toy Story. Um, oh, Pixar. Uh, Pixar. All of that comes out of that generation. So I'm on one side of the campus, and the, and, and the, and the, uh, the young and, and the other guys are on the other, the tech guys are on the other side of the campus, and they use what we did for a feature film to study what is the process that happened that did you need to go and, and, and to create an animated film. Well, anyway, Toy Story, 20 years later, was so successful that people started to say, well, that's the only way to make, because of it, 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 was, the, it was like saying, um, I can deliver, you know, uh, uh, the people are looking at the, at the, at the, at the process and, uh, and, and the, and um, the, uh, what is it? Um, it's it, it, it's such a a um, the focus was on the way the story was delivered 
and not so much on just the story. You know, the okay. a two day, a, a lot, a lot of the stuff that you see now uh, is is motion capture as well as anything yeah. else. So you don't have animators doing anything. You know, I mean, there, there's some adjustments that are made and, and things are done, but it's not like two, like a, a drawing from one person making a performance. It's you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a live actor. Uh, running through the their uh, their facial expressions and whatnot, and being captured on uh, and and uh, and used, you know, animation is, is used, is CGI is used as a mask to cover that that actor. Yeah, and there's a place for that. Oh and yeah, then, I mean, there's a great deal of the place to it, but you don't have performers with pencils anymore. And they, they laid the, uh, the blame on the process, the medium, and not the, the level of storytelling. And that's one of the things, story is all important. Whether yes. it's being printed, it's, whether it's verbal or, or, through, uh, or through motion pictures, or you're doing text. Whatever it is, you if you don't have a clear story, a clear and compelling story with characters and a satisfying uh, resolution, you're not going to have a successful piece, no matter yeah. what you do. And and the motion capture, it doesn't really take the artist completely out of the picture because they're still putting wireframes over the people and giving them different looks. Yeah, but I got to interview Catherine Beaumont. Okay. Uh, and and in that interview, she, uh, which you know, she was the voice for uh, Alice in Wonderland and uh, right. Wendy and Peter Pan. Well, they used uh, her. They used her uh, with live action. But they, exactly. They do it live action, but they use it as reference. There's a big difference. Reference is is valid, but tracing is not. And motion capture is pretty much tracing. Yeah, my my experience and my preference for uh, animation, and that's what I was sending the boy over here for, was. Yeah. Is this? Oh God, yes, that's right. Yeah, that's Gertie the dinosaur, you know. And uh, one one of the first short stories that I wrote that was not accepted for publication anywhere was um, a novella length fictional biography of Windsor McKay. Mm. Uh, that you know, it, it's just well, cartoons and animation have just been a big part of my life. Uh, I'm 52 years old, and I'm still watching new cartoons if they come out, mm -hmm. uh, if they're worth watching. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, but you weren't there for Saturday morning when Saturday morning was an event. Okay, yes. Dad, since we're talking about cartoons, why don't we talk about the very first one? We just did. You weren't here. It's great. Yeah. Yes, but he's 12 and he knows that. So. That, oh, well, that's cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching him right. That's he, right. He, you can't hear what he's saying because I have headphones on. So. Yeah, true. <laughs> and this dang coronavirus going yeah. around. It's Bye. Go by now. <laughs> he wants to run a show. Sometimes oh. I've let him do his own reviews on uh, Archie Comics. He's a huge Archie okay. comic collector. And he's got the Archie animation. So mm -hmm. um, I lost my train of thought now because I got uh, a distraction in there. <laughs> but yeah, Saturday morning was a huge event. And, uh, and it was also, you know, primetime was an event. You'd have things mm -hmm. like the Flintstones. Right. Uh, I don't know if what process The Simpsons is using, but it's still, you know, one of the longest running animated primetime shows still, out there. There's still a lot, using a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, po of, uh, of hand-drawn animation because that's the only way you could do it. They do a lot of, uh, a lot of pose, you know, uh, uh, very, very deep posing, you know, by hand. And then right. it's, you know, it's done, you know, however their, their process is at this point. But, uh, uh, but yeah, that, that, that's one of the last of the, of the hand-drawn pieces. I, I can't remember what the frame rate was, but I remember as a kid, I was a very, 24 frames a second. So 24 that frames for drawing sound, sound, but for Gertie, it was 16. Because that's, okay. before the, uh, uh, that was the, the slowest that you could turn, you know, uh, a, a hand crank uh, projector or even just a, a film uh, to be able to, um, to uh, simulate action without it being too jerky. Sure. And of course, he had to uh, invent 
a projector that would do that with these stacks of paper that he had done it on because it wasn't it wasn't done on acetate and uh no 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 he i mean uh, there there was a lot of different things there, there was the uh the cut and rip version of it. there were so many different ways of doing things but but Windsor McKay did it in uh, he did it all tracing those backgrounds are all hand traced they're all you, you know they're only about 8 by 10 sheets of rice tape uh, paper yeah so so who did come up with the innovation then of um clear acetate drawing where you just draw the background jr bray jr bray oh. did that and he did and his idea was a lot of a lot of people would do uh backgrounds and superimpose the backgrounds with the characters and he did the other way around he said okay let's do the backgrounds and then put the characters on acetate and that he had he had a copyright on that for years that had to speed things up. Oh yeah. Well, the, because you don't have to do you don't have to do uh, hand tracing of the backgrounds, you know, which is crazy. So, uh, but once again, you still have to draw, and they, they, you know, each each, you know, character it takes, you know, whatever the, whatever the uh, simplicity uh, the, the simplicity of design is like. There's there's something, you know, that it really depends. It could be anywhere from five minutes uh drawing to an hour an hour and a half depends yeah and that's for a single frame you spend that much time on it yes um and where windsor mckay had the advantage was that he was you know literally a circus performer right who was the build as the world's fastest sketch artist and he could mm -hmm. just crank these things out so quickly mm -hmm. um yeah, now nowadays you know well they probably can crank them out so quickly because what is it but a scribbly circle and and a mouth yeah. Um, but one of the things that would always fascinate me and, and puzzle me was mm -hmm. that not only were there so many drawings, right. but the animator had to know at what drawing the mouth had to open to get the, the voice to match up with it as best as possible. Well, the best way, well, what, what you would do is, um, uh, you would hire him. So no, 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 no. Okay. Um, that's a that's uh, I feel like go through periods of stag. I'm sorry, I'm reading <laughs> reading this here. Um, I feel like I go through a period. Do you have any tips to learn continuously? Uh, you keep keep drawing every day, and don't be afraid of saying I don't know. You can you know it, it it's it, things are not a steady incline. You don't you don't you don't uh, improve every day every minute. It's like you are you working along a line a certain way and then suddenly you find yourself shooting up and then you're on a plateau again and then you're shooting up again it really depends but draw every day um uh challenge yourself but don't expect yourself to find something um you know to be a, a an expert in five minutes ten minutes ten days uh, the classic thing of, of Frank Thomas, who did um, Captain Hook, for example, he was one of the the Pinocchio uh, people. Um, um, he was on Bambi. It takes a solid two, you know, say, let's say uh, five years to learn your craft, but that's working every day on a regular job. It takes about eight. It takes it takes about five years. To, to learn your craft, learn all the tools. And then it takes you another five years to really to master the craft of those, how to use those tools. And then it takes about 10 years to become a solid animator where you don't need reference. And so don't worry about it. Don't just, you know, just keep on working. You know, don't get frustrated. Just enjoy the process. If you don't enjoy the process, uh, you, you've, you've, uh, there's no amount of money is going to to make you feel good about it. So that's my suggestion on that. That's why I wanted to to, to, to catch this gentleman here. Thank uh, you, Connor. Connor, that's a great question. Connor, if you're still on the line listening here, uh, DM us at Critical Blast over on Twitter. Let us know. We would like to send you this copy of Frozen 2 on Blu-ray. It's still in the shrink wrap, so you get your digital copy as well. Uh, 
that's for asking an excellent question here and guiding the uh, topic of conversation onward. Mm -hmm. uh, before we got into that, we were discussing uh, getting the mouth to, ma to match okay. the, right. the speaker. Right. Well, you have a track, you know, the, the, we call it a mag track. But anyway, the, the traditional uh, uh, 35 millimeter film runs at 24 frames per second. And you have a magnetic track with a soundtrack that where you record all of uh, all of your dialogue. And um, you can you can then um, you can you run it through what's a a, uh, a sound editing process at 24 frames per second. So you can see the modulation and you can hear the words going up and down. You know, like like how are you slowly? And then you can tell at what frame that are or ha, whatever you you phonetically. You can then write it down on corresponding exposure sheet, and and this is one of the things about animation. Can I make a quick step out here? Absolutely, you go right for it. And while he's gone, we will take this opportunity to let people know that Critical Blast is branching out into publishing. We are now Critical Blast Publishing, and we will remind you that in the link below, you can find our link to Amazon for our hardcover young adult superhero novel. Uh, this is Bulletproof Origins by Stephen J. Mitchell. And this is the story of young Cody Haywood who wakes up on his 16th birthday to find out that he is, as the title says, bulletproof. Uh, living in a world with superheroes, he decides to become one. Unfortunately for Cody, he has the attention span of a ferret on pixie sticks. So <laughs> focusing is a little bit of a problem for him. Uh, which is going to be a bigger problem when the terrorists decide they'd like to catch him, dissect him, and make themselves bulletproof. That is Bulletproof Origins, available on Amazon in hardcover, soon to be out in softcover. Uh, also, while you're looking at that description down there, you'll find a link to John's Indiegogo for Rough Sketch, and we will be talking about that coming up here shortly. John, you are back. Uh, let's yep. show everybody what you brought. Okay. Here's an exposure sheet. Okay. And, and, and if you can see here, I'm telling where oh, each one of those these spaces here. Let's see where we are. Okay, that is a frame. Each one of these are frames, and you can see frame counts like 61, 62, 63, 64, etc. This here is one second of film. These are the the 24 frames from uh, that's frame eight, 16, and then. 24. And so you would mark down on each one of those frames what sound was on that frame. Now, if it went, if the if the frame went, if the sound went for uh say six frame six frames, you'd mark it down that way. So you knew exactly where every sound was, the beginning, the end, even the modulation, a pop or a slide up to that sound. So you could have total control. This is very similar to uh, what people use now, you know, in terms of your timeline. You see that? Yeah. That's exactly. Absolutely. Timeline. Yeah. This is what we had before. So we would then write and use this to uh, create our um, to 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 uh, direct our actions. So that way, I know how how what kind of a of a step, how many frames for that step. You know, and then what now, kind of tempo, and then put down uh, music and such on that. I'm trying to do the math in my head here. That's 24 times 60 for a minute. Yeah. And then your average cartoon would be what, 20 minutes? Uh, no, a short, uh, a short cartoon during the, during the, uh, the. Let's 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 go to the Disney of 1930s and 40s and whatnot. That was anywhere between five minutes and six minutes, depending upon what they want, you know, or what, what they allowed for it. But um, a, um, a minute is 1,440 frames. That's a lot of sketches. Yes, yes. So if you're doing it all on ones and then you have two characters, well, then you have to double that up. And if you have seven dwarfs, you have to figure all that out. So if how does a team of animators work because I would think that even if you've got, you know, all these sheets saying, okay, this sound is happening here, this sound's happening there, 
you got animator A and animator B, they can't draw the same Fred Flintstone and have it look exactly like the same Fred Flintstone, no matter how much of a style sheet they're following, uh, just to save well, time, yeah, can well, they? Yeah. Well, what happens is, is that you make sure that you, you team your people, you know, like you'd have a supervising animator, you have a director to have the, to, to deal with all the overall material, okay? You know, as someone has to have an overall vision. But what happens is that you then have uh, sequence directors or you have directing animators that have been chosen for their particular talents as to how to handle characters or, or uh, certain types of action. So, and then they then would have their own team that they would then um, uh, lay out for, they would do, you know, particular posing and whatnot, and they would be the ones who would, who would, who would manage that sequence and those scenes. And so certain people would, would be good on, well, if you're on a long shot, you know, they don't have, they don't have to be quite on model because, you know, you're, it, the, the ones who really had good abilities to, uh, to have great, pencil control and could act with their eyes and what have you. They did all of the close-ups. And then you had those who were a little lesser, you know, did maybe a full bodies or longer shots. You know, there was okay. a way of handling things. So that's how, that's how you would do it. But Fred Flintstone, you, but then those things, those here, you would go through assistance and they would, they would be, um, you know, um, taking care of making sure things were on model. But also, you have the underlight, which is you take your model sheet, you put, you tape it, you put it underneath your drawing, and you trace, and you make sure that you got all the right proportions. Everything is not freehand. You know, you don't have to trace it, but you know, have something right there to say, okay, it's right under me. I know what that is because you would do it for production. You would have three different levels, like say you could have a, a, a you know, a, a model sheet. And then blow that up to the size of what you want for a close up, or you would have for a medium shot or for full body. It was so way so many ways of uh, of uh, of doing these things to maintain control. Okay, so that's what that's what it, how it would work. Now, I'm, I'm thinking of an entirely different thing now because you were talking about these close ups and everything. With, with a character running across the screen, and especially with something like the Flintstones, I get the same window going back and forth. That was the largest house in the world he had. Okay. Um, but when you actually start to do a, something cinematic where you zoom in on a scene, mm -hmm. are you drawing the picture a little larger each time? No, or is the camera oh, no, just no, no, the in camera's like zooming in, yeah. The camera is zooming. Okay. Yeah, you have, you, you see, you have a 12, you, you start, you have a 12 field as the, as the largest, and they could go to about six field which is, you know, uh, about six inches across the page, you know, like, so that's, that, a, a field is, 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 is an inch. And that's how we would do it. Cause, cause you know, uh, the, the, the paper was 12 and a quarter inches and the edges of that. And then, you know, they would be, that's the way we worked it out. I mean, that's, that's, that's just the way it is. And, and uh, so, but you had a camera that would, that would dolly in, dolly down, and dolly up. So, and and you would and you would uh, calculate those uh, those increments. I got it. Okay. Um, let's back up to your career now. And mm -hmm. you 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 know all these technical terms, and and I'm learning jargon even as we're speaking here. Because, mm -hmm. uh, what got you into animation? I mean, where where did you? I've looked at your IMDb. I could pull it back up again, but I'd rather you know you tell us how there's more to it than just a chart on the computer. <laughs> yes. Well, okay. I, I've always wanted to be a cartoonist, um, but when I was growing up in Brooklyn, this is I'm um, growing up during the 1950s uh, and uh, you know in, in grammar school in the 1960s, and um, yeah, I've always wanted to be a cartoonist. The during the I there wasn't much call for being a sports cartoonist or anything like that. I wound up going to uh, having an academic career. I went to to um, uh, to Fordham University. Went to Pratt Institute, Fordham University. Um, finally got into uh, you know uh, communication arts, but I'm, I was always self-taught. 
as an as a as an artist. And I've always wanted to be a, a comic strip artist, not a comic book artist, as much as much as I wanted to be a comic strip artist. So you know, you're learning about uh, gags and how to how to uh, how to draw with a with a uh, brush and with a quill and with uh, with all the all the tech technical things that you that you have. But it was still basically very much of a is your pencil and a brush yeah. and that's and, and and a bottle of ink and you make everything happen. So I I I, I wanted to be a cartoonist. Taught myself how to draw. And then finally, I discovered that that I could do quick sketches and capture motion, you know, just with with yeah. je fast gesture drawings of maybe thirty seconds, a minute at the most. That's all I needed. And so I said, well, how do I make a make a, a, a career out of this? How do what do I do? Because when I was when I was uh, in in college at Fordham, people were this was. Uh, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72. People were great. We were having a bad time. You know, there, were, there was sort of a recession back then. And there were a lot of, of, uh, of college students who with masters and with doctorates were driving cabs because they couldn't find work. So I was trying to figure out how do I find a job? Because we were hitting through the period of time in, in New York City, because that's where I grew up in Brooklyn. New York City, and if you remember how New York was having a problem, they were going under. So yeah. there was a lot happening during those dark times. But I found that I could do drawings like this, I could capture motion. So I decided to go into the School of Visual Arts for a six week, one night a week summer class, and that's the training that I got. And the the, the art the uh, the teacher in charge. Was an old Terry Tunes, you know, Mighty Mouse. Yes. Fan, you know, and uh, he said, "Well, there's a bunch of people who are going, you know, who were uh, starting out in uh, New York Tech, and they were hiring for young people. They were trying to do a feature called Tubby the Tuba, which is based on the Paul Tripp uh, story and and all and and the music. And they were all Popeye Mighty Mouse animators from the Fleischers." And 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 uh, and and Terry Tune and Paramount Studios. So that's where I got my training. It was there. I traveled. It was a four and a half hour round trip from Brooklyn to Long Island. I did that every day for fourteen months. Wow! And that's where I learned wow. my my the all of the technical material. All everything. All my basics were there. And that's how I learned how I broke in. And that's from nineteen. That's 1970. That's in fact, it's March. Well, it was almost like, was it 1975? So, pretty like 45 years ago, this March is when I broke into the business. Okay, and then yeah, after Terry the Tuba, you went on to um... Raggedy Ann and Andy. That was where where uh, uh, was that the one with the octopus? <laughs> Pardon? Was that the one with the giant octopus? That's uh, 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 Raggedy Ann and Andy had uh, the the uh, um, the greedy in the taffy pit. Yeah, and, and then I think a, he had a giant octopus at the end to grab your the book. character called the Gazooks was sort of an octopus kind of character in there. And then and the, uh, Raggedy Ann and Andy was was direct being directed by Richard Williams, who went on to direct um, Roger Rabbit. Oh, okay. Now that's that one I'm definitely familiar with. That's amazing. But I, I do remember um, the Raggedy Ann and Andy one because it was just, I don't know why. I just watched it when I was a, a kid and it always just stuck with me. I remember, the, was it Marcella? The, the, yeah. the yeah, snotty that's little doll that ran off and they ran off to save her from herself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the. I, I don't yeah. remember much about it, but. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, well, that was sort of a critical bang. That was a big bang. For the young animators, uh, the uh, out of that group came all sorts of animators who who wound up uh, designing um, uh, uh, Little Mermaid, um, uh, the uh, uh, Aladdin, uh, who uh, uh, went on to uh, Eric Goldberg went on to uh, 
to animate the genie in Aladdin. Um, well, wow, that's really neat. Yeah, and then with a whole, there's a whole bunch of us that came out of that because there hadn't been a new generation of young animators for 20 years breaking into the in wow. this world. sure yeah because nothing had there was there was no there was no room for new people so. now speaking of teams of animators from breaking in and everything one of the people i've had the privilege of interviewing um and i've got the audio out on our on our anchor fm podcast where it's no video just audio uh, i've spoke with lou scheimer at okay, length yes. about um, yes. the work that he did and and you've worked uh on on he-man and she-ra sure. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things he, he talks about is the way that filmation got started was he had no animators for an animation mm -hmm. studio. And it was it was him and uh, I want to say Bill Prescott. Um, well, there's, there was Lou, Sh Lou Scheimer, Bill Prescott, uh, Hal Sutherland. Yeah, Hal Sutherland. And, and they basically got this contract from D.C. to do Superman with no animators. Right. And uh, El Elliot S. Magan is taking the tour and they've hired actors to play the roles of of animators and one of the actors they hired uh was a young ted knight right uh, and he was like and his role was um says hey whenever we come by here we'll look at your stuff and you'll say hey lou we need certain amount of material right. if we're going right. to get this thing done on time <laughs> well elliot walked past him and they didn't get it and ted wanted to say his line so he chased <laughs> him down <laughs> and he was going hey lou hey lou and i'm thinking <laughs> Shades of the Mary Tyler Moore show. That's yes, what he's going to say all the time, all his <laughs> life. <laughs> but but how did you get involved with with Lou and, and company? Well, I was working on. I'd finished. Let's see. I was working at um, after leaving Nelvan, I came down and was working on on Dragon's Lair and Space Ace, the video games. Yes. And then that that ended, and I went around to various things of was was uh was at at uh at several different studios and those jobs ended and whatnot and i brought my reel uh i knew that that uh and we were going to a really bad time in california for work and so i said well i'm just going to go to um um you know to filmation and see if they're hiring and and they were the only ones who were really hiring they were doing he-man and shira show so i brought my reel of animation from nelvana which was for rock and rule and uh so uh union member and what have you and how southern looked at it, he says okay I, he hired me on the spot to be you know to go on to the, the, a, a a feature unit that they were trying to start up and so there weren't very many people in california in the industry who had worked on features other than being at Disney's. And back then right. in 80, I want to say 84, 1984, 1985, um, there had only been maybe a couple of dozen animated features ever done. And, you know, and, and, and that was a very rare thing. And most of them were done at Disney's. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, Nelvana, they're they're a Canadian company, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And we did. That's where we did uh, uh, the uh, Star Wars Holiday Special cartoon, and that's where you know, and I animated Boba Fett. So okay, that, very cool. That's my. That's uh, that. That's that's a, a a really cool spot there, and that's where we did Rock and Roll and um, and and a bunch of of shows that were half hour specials and. That were that was about as as full animation as you could get at the time, so yeah. yeah. Anyway, I watched Rock and Roll when I was in college, and that's one of the. It's one of those movies where it's like you know I love that thing, why don't I own it? Uh, so <laughs> that 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 and Heavy Metal are two that I really need to add to my collection if I just see them sometime and say, oh yeah, I got to buy that. I thought I thought that that there was still some sort of. You know, there were they were, for a while they had a, uh, a company out of Cal out of uh, Florida had bought the rights to distribute it, and you know uh, they can they had uh, they had done a uh, you know uh, a disc of it, and so you could get it at on Amazon. But I don't know if you could probably mm -hmm. still get that a Blue Wave Blue uh, Ray version of it. I don't know, but um, anyway, yeah, that's that's. 
it, it was it, it it was very much of a um, a time that's 1980 to 82 and you know uh that was a bad time for all kinds of feature animation for 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 for, uh, for um yeah for feature animation it was a it was a very yeah. tough time so that's how mm-hmm. it got into got to uh to um to filmation is i walked in the door and uh was looking for work and showed awesome. my reel and that's how i got it so uh, the, the the most basic of ways to get a job is yes. you walk in right. and ask for one yes and then, of course, I think it was L'Oreal bought out Filmation and closed it down. And yeah. I think they were the last uh, American, U- last United States uh, animation house. Yeah, went, that was that was really sad. Be- it was it was terribly sad. And um, that's what uh, Lou was was a re- it was the best boss I've ever worked for because he cared about doing stuff and keeping work for people. And that was the basic reason why the stuff was n- never jobbed out. Everything was under the same roof, you know. Yeah. You, so, uh, I, I I remember him telling me about that, and you you could you could hear him getting choked up about what had happened to to his company. Um, yeah. when it got bought out, and it was just yeah. it was a real shame that that happened. Yeah. Um, it, it was it was more than just the closing of a company; it was the closing of an era. Uh, yeah. back when you know animation was really something i i don't know maybe maybe one of the things that has killed animation for me is the ubiquity of it thanks to 24 hour mm-hmm. access to it oh um, yeah it's not there's nothing special about it you know because right. yeah you know, because first of all it's not even hand drawn but it's it's it, it, it is everywhere it is everywhere and uh, it used to be a, a a an event to see a feature film that was animated and even the shorts were only every now and you know every. Uh, I think they were like if you, when you went to uh, a movie theater, uh, say a Popeye. A Popeye should only did about t- ten or twelve of those a year. Okay, they, so there were only that many shorts, and we're just we just, just watching. We're just binge you know, them on Popeyes, the TV. Well, you know, twelve, you know, you know, a twelve, a once a month. They would release a new one, maybe. Yeah. Or maybe every six weeks, what have you. And then they have other shorts in there too. But you know, nothing. The market was not flooded. So right. Anyway, everybody's and, got and their own version. Yeah. Yeah, and and of course, my opinion of the animation I watch now is low. Um, this this guy here was watching. What were we watching? We were watching Teen Titans Go versus Teen Titans. Yeah. Uh, awesome. And they showed the commercial for the new Thundercats Roar. They said, "Stay tuned for the for the Thundercats Roar show coming on." And he's like, "Oh, I want to watch that. Can I step and watch that?" And I'm like, "Okay, but watch this first. And and I brought up a YouTube clip of the original Thundercats. Uh-huh. I said, "This is what it's supposed to be, and that's what you're getting." And his exact words were, "That sucks. I'm not watching it." And it was <laughs> like, it was like, okay, the old Thundercats. It was like really good. Yeah. But today it's just horrible. Mm-hmm. So that's your market, animator people out there in uh, okay. animator land. <laughs> yeah. But, hmm. um, okay, so we've talked a lot about animation, and I don't want to totally focus on that, even though, you know, that is your your, your bailiwick, but you have other things that you've done. Uh, we're both happen to be uh, crime and suspense authors. Right. Uh, I, I've, I've told you in chats that I'm currently working on Warren Murphy's The Destroyer series. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but but you had tweeted to me that you and your wife had worked on some crime novels. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe you could tell the tell the audience a little bit about that when that when that happened and where they could find those. Well, last well, uh, back in the um, mid nineties, uh, we were working on uh, trying to do something for ourselves, a pro- project that we could work together. Uh, and so we said, well, let's try. Uh, you know, she was trying to do. Uh, we were just floundering or about, and we settled on 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 doing, uh, you know, uh, not just crime novels but uh, mysteries. So we came right. up with uh, with with a character similar to you know, there's some aspect of of my wife, but you know, it was a it was a character named Kate Cavanaugh who was a a culinary detective and uh, and in uh, out of the Cincinnati area. 
And uh, so we did three books of those and, and self-published them. We did one a year, you know, and uh, and uh, then we wound we got we got into um, uh, mystery bookstores. We got accepted into the into the uh, uh, Mystery Writers of America based on our self-publishing. We got we got reviewed. We got reviewed by not just well so the the Cincinnati Inquirer refused to in, review us because we weren't a real publisher. We were just we were we were. Uh, vanity author right okay and, and let me remind everybody watching that um uh, self-publishing in the 90s was not as easy as it is today and it wasn't looked on the same way as it is today you couldn't just pop something out at iUniverse universe and have it distributed everywhere in the world no. you had to really put some effort into this right well we wound up being picked up by ingram baker and taylor uh, uh all of those so we were in barnes and noble we were in the various. We were we were allowed. We were in the, all of the, the the systems, you know, where so you could see us and, and find us everywhere. Um, then we we after three of those books, we wound up with you know uh, uh, going. It was a, a sort of a tangent. One of the characters was a long lost relative of Kate's, and it, it goes back to the days of the nineteen forties. Where of uh, Newport, Kentucky, which is Las Vegas before Las Vegas, that's where okay. Las Vegas comes from, basically. So we were doing his two historical crime, uh, crime fiction novels, um, and they were based on what was going on at the time, using a combination of of, uh, of fictional and real characters. So we were. Oh. That's a fun, fun mix. Oh yeah, and and that's where I, you know, uh, you, you, we're developing, you know, one part of the thing of when you do historical context and you using the actual events, interweaving fictional characters in a way that they cross into that, you have to do some really, really strong and definitive timelines, and that's where. I started using the whole process of well, it's not just you know uh, plot A and plot plot B. Sometimes you have three, four characters all interweaving with each other. So I would have huge sheets of paper where I put post-it notes and say, okay, this is what's happening, and this is at this time of day, and this is what happened at that time of day historically. Get that straight, and then you can figure out. Where to put the characters, but it's all part of like by like, like doing an animated film because animated films nothing is done until you put pencil to paper. It's not like you could yeah. shoot live action ten to one and have all these different camera angles and then you know piece together something. You know, once you start writing, you better you know if you're going to hit certain things to make it believable. It's not just spontaneity. There is a lot of of wiring and and architecture that goes into that into the structure that allows you to be spontaneous and and get that feeling. I've tried to do that whole uh, fictional within uh, non-fictional world, and I am just too tied to reality to do it. I can't. I, I see these people doing historical novels, and it's just it feels so free flow. I'm like, no, no, no. I have, I know everything they did on this day, this day, and this day. I don't know what they did on that day. So that could have been the day they yeah. thought the Martians. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> well, that's a, you know, yeah, that's the same thing. That's really that's how we tried it. I mean, we said, the, you know, when there when there is a doubt, when they say we don't really know what happened, that's when or why that happened. Then you're allowed to use your fictional characters to say this potentially is what could happen. You know, you, you know, yeah. for example, you know, you you, you have a you have a uh, a news item on which, like, what we use, where uh, what one character uh, character was, was is found dead somewhere, uh, you know, like uh, uh, 17 miles away in a car. Well, and they said we don't, we just don't know. What happened? You know what what happened? So this for, so that we use that as, as one of our threads in one in, in one in one story. So yeah. use it. Yeah, exactly. I've got a a long story that I'm I keep coming back to uh, involving Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, H.P. Lovecraft, 
and mm. the Mothman. Uh, and, and it all stems from how Edgar Allan Poe died, which, you know, mm. he stumbled into a doctor's office, uh, mumbling incoherently. Uh, and his last words were about somebody named Reynolds. And then he died. I'm like, well, there is a mystery story right yeah. there. Yeah. Um, of course, mine was all about a crash landed alien who's waiting to be rescued. And it's going to take a couple of hundred years. But <laughs> and then, you know, along the way, he's he's cited by, um, you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs, who turns him into one of the four four armed men of Barsoom mm. and by H.P. Lovecraft, who turns him into one of the uh, elder gods coming out of the the silver key the story of the silver key mm -hmm. um he had a giant insect looking like creature that looked exactly like the creatures on bar soon i'm like well what if they all got inspired by seeing the same creature who mm -hmm. also looks exactly like the mothman uh of you know the west virginia sightings so it's it's that kind of historical stuff you can really have some fun with the stuff that you don't know enough about um mm -hmm. now i tried that with um eight uh windsor mckay yeah. and that's why his biography is fictional because nobody knew that much about him and by the time I got it done somebody wrote a biography on him that totally invalidated everything I had surmised and just threw it out like well okay this is a fictional biography now this is what could have happened uh, was that John Cain uh, Maker's book yes yes it was I've got it over here uh, yeah. along with the giant size uh, Little Nemo um, yeah. <laughs> if it's Windsor McKay I've got it but you, you mentioned that your lead character, though, in this was a culinary detective. How do you um, come up with something like that as far as, uh, let's talk about building characters, designing characters. What's a culinary detective and why? Well, well what it was was that there is, uh, uh, the first one was uh, Kate Cavanaugh, and uh, we decided to do the series based on ingredients. So we, we start with, you know, add one dead critic was the first one. Then okay. beat a rotten egg to the punch was another one. And then carve a witness to shreds was uh, was the third one that we did uh, for, uh, for that those three series. Now, at the time, my wife uh, had, had gone to culinary school at, uh, at RISD, at uh, Rhode Island uh, Institute of uh, School of Design. Uh, and, and she went to a culinary school there. And so she was working in, in, the, bakes, in the bakeries and things of that sort. Uh, but um, so she had extensive experience working in, in kitchens and whatnot. So she knew about the catering business. One of the characters, we decided, well, well let's do this here. What, what, what is it about uh, the Kate that is, is different? Well, she's somebody that went out and, and, and had a, a, a life uh, of during the 60s or the 70s and whatnot and, and uh, went out to uh, you know, India and whatnot. So we followed a lot of the stuff that, that my wife did, you know, and uh, being a breast uh, cancer survivor also you know, at the age of like 37. So all of these various things we put into Kate and sort of we started building up, what is she looking for? What, what are things that she can do, but also well, why is she doing these things? And that is really proving herself to her mother, uh, having to deal with her own life, being somebody who is always, um, you know, um, someone outside of society in the normal thing. I mean, you try and fit in, but at the same time, there's more to it. You just, you know, you're just trying to, you know, you, you, what are your goals? But what are you, how are you different from somebody else? And so th those were the, uh, the for, for Kate Cavanaugh, that's what we did for her. And she would, and we would call that the journals of Kate Cavanaugh because she would write down what was going on. And so, therefore, we understood, you know, it was like a diary that we, yeah. that we would run. It's, it's always um, nice when you can base your character off of somebody in real life as much as possible. Right. Uh, and get away with it. Uh, sometimes, you know, you're like, okay, this is a really evil person. And if I say that it's based on this person, that person might sue me. Right. Uh, but like with the Destroyer, you know, all the bad guys are generally pulled from the headlines and, and all the major characters are satires and parodies of politicians and pop culture icons um in uh, continental divide which was the second destroyer novel i got to work on mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've got um enigmas unlimited mm -hmm. which is uh it was, it was ted and diane and uh 
Zelma and Ziggy. Uh, okay. <laughs> and their giant Great Dane. So well, I, 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 I'm curious about this air. How much, how much, uh, I know you're working, are you, you're working with the publisher, but how much of it is, are you, you hampered by what is expected and how much of it can you bring to it that's different from what was gone before? Uh, you know, I, I can't, can't, can't change continuity much as I might be trying sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but, but no, it's, uh, there's a formula to a destroyer story. And, you know, I try to follow that. It, it actually helps guide the writing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I said, well, they're all the good destroyer stories are generally uh, this many chapters, this many words. It's a fast read. Mm -hmm. uh, you always start off with the, yeah. the, the victim who mm -hmm. ends up, you know, being killed in such a fashion that they're like, uh, you know, and, and who, who is going to, you know, ever solve this murder and discover that the government is trying to turn us into uh, giant cheese bricks if, if they fire off this laser? And then, of course, the second answer is always his name was Remo. Mm -hmm. And you move on from there. And Remo's doing something that has absolutely nothing to do with the novel, uh, wrapping up some other case that he was on. Mm -hmm. All in so, bed? Yes, son. You know, earlier you said I, you were like, you've got a little Nemo over here. Yes, I do. Dad, Dad, time for school, Dad. Time for school, time for school. No, that's not, not a little emotive. You're done. Go. Oh, I don't know where he come up with that, but... Uh, I apologize. He's usually in bed by now, but his mother is um, not aware he snuck out. <laughs> so he's he's overly tired. But, yeah, I, I try to just, you know, obviously they... They want me to add as much as I can to it, uh, as right. far as the villains go. They, you know, I try not to repeat uh, right. certain villains that have come up too soon because, you know, the destroyer is an assassin, and if you have recurring villains, then he's not really good at his job. No, he's not. No, no, <laughs> not at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's only a handful of people who've survived all this that can show up, and, and if they keep showing up, then it makes him look bad. Right. Right. Well. Um... It, it, it's one of the things about it is that it do you, when you're one of the things to keep uh, a, a series fresh. I mean, you have the villains, and you know if if you're always having a new villain, that's one thing. How did he? How uh, it's it's keeping. And it was an interesting thing. Just um, now, you know the, the shadow, the uh, the pulp character that was sure. they. Uh, my understanding, Maxwell Brand, uh, Grant, uh, that was the pseudonym for, what was his name? Um, who was the writer? Oh, uh, Walter B. Gibson, who was the, yes. who was the, the, the writer for that whole thing. For the, 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 you know, 240 of those, they, he popped out one every once a month, <laughs> you know, basically. Uh, one of the things he said was he would, he would, I'll always be adding something new to the shadow. There was something that he would always change things or just add something. You only knew so much of it. And so he would add something to sort of make the character a little fresher every couple of not, uh, stories or what have you. With, uh, with Remo, do you have that? You know, or... There, there was that uh, because there was always, especially in the earlier novels, there was the, the training because Remo was still training to become the master of Sinanju. Mm -hmm. So you'd always have a training chapter where he was learning something new uh, mm -hmm. and, and failing at it uh, mm -hmm. because Master, master Chun would always um, let him know what, what an awful uh, ingrate and incompetent person he was. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then at some point, Remo became the actual master of Sinanju, uh, which sort of took away from that. So so one of the things that I have been able to add is um, the Master's Scrolls, uh, which are going to make me, I think I just spoiled something. Oh. Uh, assuming that it even keeps the manuscript now because it's in um, books 154 and 155, which are uh, with the publisher now, Devin Murphy, uh, Warren Murphy's son is the publisher. Mm -hmm. uh, but the notion came to me that Remo had achieved the level of Master and it's like master of who, because mm -hmm. he doesn't have an apprentice. He's still uh, going out with Chun, the older one. 
Uh, he's not like he's training somebody else in Sananju, so why is he called master? He's got the skill level for it, mm -hmm. but he's not doing the job of it. Mm -hmm. And I came up with the idea that there were these master's scrolls that were there to instruct the master of Sananju after they had achieved the level of master. So, you know, he's he's like, you know, wait a second, I've gone through all the scrolls. I've achieved the level of master. And he's like, yes, now you get to go to second grade. <laughs> these are the thing these are the things that you can only learn once you have achieved mastery of Sananjo. Mm. Uh, and he's like all this stuff was was like parables and and oblique notions to get you into the way of doing things. This is what really happened. And this is what you really have to learn. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll see okay. how that flies. Okay. Okay. But but yeah, the the whole learning process uh and the constant learning process is what makes the character interesting. And if he's <laughs> learned everything there is to learn, then it, it takes away some of that interest. So I was trying to uh, trying to add that back if I can. We'll see how that works. Right. Well, that's that's the kind of thing I want to do with with my comic books, which is, you know, I've got my Mega Moose character. Yeah. Let's talk about the comic books now, because that is ostensibly what we talk about the most on these channels is, is the comic books. OK, well, I'm starting off. I, I finished the uh, I'm, I'm fulfilling the two in the Indigo, well, the uh, the Kickstarter and the Indiegogo campaigns for Rough Sketch, which was right. my, is my portfolio. And uh, and so what I'm going to do once I finish that. Uh, uh, you know, fulfilling all that, I'm going to carry on uh, with a uh, with uh, a. I had done two books for uh, for for kids you know, the ages of four to about eight, and that was the Snuffy and Zoe books that I did the comics. Yes. There. So um, I'm going to do. I, I I resurrected a character that I I started uh, that I. Um, Copyrighted and 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 uh, drew back in about 89, 1989, 1990, Mega Moose, and I did that for uh, for uh, a, a a a magazine for about eight, fourteen to eighteen months. So I was I was doing I, I did that. I did essentially you know uh, four pan or four uh, sections each. You know for each. That would be the equivalent of four weeks, you know, a, a, a weekly uh, Sunday page. But I did it four times for each issue. So I did that for, you know, about, as I said, 14 to 18 months. And so anyway, I decided, I, I thought, well, let me, let me resurrect this character. But I changed it so that there is a touch of the old Captain Marvel in it. Oh, nice. And so, and so, what I've done is I've done the the origin story. It's a twelve story, twelve page story, and then I'm doing a sixteen page story, which will, when you combine, it's you know there's twenty eight pages of story, and do that as 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 a uh, a standalone. So I have that, but I'll but I'm going to do, I want to issue do a, a Kickstarter with 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 John the Animator Comics with my logo and. Issue you know, and just just launch all you know of the these three books the the two Snuffy and Zoe books which is one is the dragon and the cupcake and then what do you do with the stinky pirate that's the, those are those are the two Snuffy and Zoe books and then there is the the magnificent Mega Moose book that will be you know uh, by itself uh, uh, two stories in that and then a coloring book and a coloring and drawing and coloring book with snuffy and zoe teaching you know principles of drawing and then you know how to make characters you know uh, how to make expressions and whatnot and then also having a coloring thing a coloring section and then do that as one one set or you could do you know, just buy one book or, or each of the other ones, or then do it as a as a family pack. But the idea is to start releasing books with stuff either Snuffy and Zoe or Mega Moose. And now, are you going to do any animation. animation with them? No, 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 because it takes a long time. Yeah, I'm not going to. No, I'm. I'm just, I would rather my energy level is such. I mean, I, I I'm past seventy now, so <laughs> my energy is. You look great. Thank you. 
Thanks. Uh, so I need, I need, uh, I, I want to focus on this so that I can do these stories and do them in a regular way. Like for example, um, the, uh, and this is just, uh, this is, this is show and tell time. You know, thumbnails are like this here. You know, I'm doing, I'm doing this kind of stuff here, writing the stuff and, and storyboarding it and giving the panels and what have you. Um, but I want to be able to focus on that versus trying to do all the drawings. It takes it takes such a long time, you know. So, what? But with with Mega Moose, it's there's the the idea of the character change. You know, it's a character. The, the you know, uh, Nicky Nardson is the school nerd. He's the he's picked on by all the kids, and uh, without telling, without. You go explicitly. He he's given a magic feather, and then uses it, and he sneezes, and he turns into Megamus. Now, I'm I'm going to ask the question. If it's a spoiler, then 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 tell me you can't answer it. But is um is his non-mega alter ego also a moose, or is he uh, like like a human character? Oh, it's a human character. Okay. These are all human characters, and he turns into Mega Moose because he's a power totem. Uh, okay. You know, a, a, a moose, a, a moose in, in, in shamanism is one of the most powerful totems there are, which is you know, the, the spirit of the, of the animal. Mega Moose gets all of the, he gets all of the powers of the animal kingdom. With which is like you know he has he can he can lift tall he le he can leap tall buildings he could he can he could do all of these various things but only because he waves this magic feather in his in his nose but when he sneezes he turns into mega moose but if he sneezes again he turns back into the nerd oh so there's a secret uh, there, there's a weakness there if you want to uh, conquer mega moose you just make him sneeze and now yep. he's in trouble right. Yeah, I mean, it's, and 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 but nobody nobody believes him that he is Mega Moose. He tries to tell people he's got these powers, and no one believes him because they said he's a nerd. You know, you can't possibly be worth anything. So we have this character thing, the dynamic of somebody trying to say, "Hey, I'm special," but no one will believe me. I'm I'm kind of reminded of a uh, book that Red Circle put out, and you you might be aware of it. Uh, again, the nerd who gets these powers from an alien yep. uh, where he, he can transform into a powerful character. The, fly. But the powerful character is, no, not the fly, uh, Thunder Bunny. Oh, okay. And, and he turns into this powerful character, but he's a powerful giant pink rabbit with, yes. with the ears and everything. <laughs> well, I, what I did was with the, um, uh, for, the, uh, for the sneeze, it, you know, it's Achu is A C H O O exclamation point. Okay. And right. that is ant, uh, <laughs> you know, cougar, <laughs> you know, a hawk, otter, uh, owl, and then many more for the exclamation point. So he has all these powers. There's amazing powers that, 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 ant, that, that animals have. So anyway, Absolutely. yeah, that, that's the thing. So I, I figured this is something. It's in a an, an very animatable style, uh, uh, but it's it's my personal style of drawing. And I figured, well, let's have this kind of fun with this because it's it's there's a lot of seriousness in it in terms of what the character has to go through. And he's also 12, 12, 13 years old. And, you know, he's trying to cope with being a person on the outside of society, even though, you know, he wants to be part of it, but he's, you know, he's not accepted. Sure. So, so when are we going to see, when are we going to see that launch? That sounds like something I would love to get behind. Uh, well, the thing is, is that I want to make sure uh, that I have everything ready, colored and the whole thing. So it'll probably be, you know, towards the, the end of, I would say, just to be on the safe side, uh, probably. At the, at the end of of the of of summer, you know, okay. that, because you know we're going through this, you know, coronavirus thing, and people are not going to be interested. There's a lot of stuff going on, but I had already figured that the best time is as the, the beginning of the year to me is always September, where it's getting into 
that time where you're going to school and you're starting to think about summer, about 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 things to get away from school or touch. Yeah, I don't know, it's always been that way for me. But I, I'm just trying to give myself enough time that because I'm going to draw this thing, I've got to finish writing it. I have written it, but I just have to thumbnail it. I have to I have to draw the whole thing, the 16 pages. I then have to uh, uh, clean it up. Then I have to color it. I have to letter it. And I just meet, want it all ready to go and without any problems. And then I'll uh, then then I'll start, you know, I'll start the uh, uh, pitch the um, the um, the campaign, you know, on Kickstarter and on Indiegogo. But again, so you're going to start a campaign with a finished product. That's unheard of. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I did with the Insta. That's what I did with with kicks with the uh, the rough sketch. That way, you know, uh, I can then you know make my delivery correctly in uh, within five to six months. Sure. Now, rough sketch is the one that um, that's a present that we, that we have linked. Yeah, it's uh, where it's it's still on. Um, uh, it's Indiegogo on in demand. Okay. And uh, tell us a little bit about what that book is entailing right after we get to Connor here. Uh, he says, yeah. I have some oil painting work that I need to get done tonight, so I'll have to catch the rest of your stream later. Have a good night and good luck with your projects. Connor, thank you for popping thank in. You. I hope you did get the uh, DM to us on Twitter there. I'll check that later and get you your copy of Frozen 2. Uh, and we were going to find out what is going on in uh, Rough Sketch, and then we're going to just close things out for the night. Okay. Well, Rough Sketch is basically my portfolio in which I show how I, I do, I use, I've got drawings from every stage of my career from the beginning when I was like six years old, <laughs> I've got drawings from that, but, 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 and that's a very short, that's like a page or two, what you know, drawing here and there and what have you, uh, but just say, okay, this is what a six year old did. And then within, you know, quickly go into Raggedy Ann and Andy and, uh, and uh, uh, Devil and Daniel Mouse. Uh, uh, Love that okay. one. Yeah, Devil and Daniel Mouse. I did. I did Dan Dan Mouse, but I also was originally supposed to do the Devil. So I've got drawings that I did that were never used you know, animation wise, but you know, they, but I kept them all. So I did Dan Mouse. You got the Devil. Then I got Boba Fett. You know, uh, pay about twelve drawings of Boba Fett. From the holiday special, did then for rock and rule. I've got uh, I've got Quad Hole, the police chief, Cindy, the roller skating gal, and then Mylar, the uh, uh, the the club owner, uh, and also have then oh uh, I've got drawings from uh, Dragon's Lair. Okay, from so this is all archival stuff. Then I, I didn't yeah. know if this was like you were drawing new things. No, no, no. This is your... all. This goes back forty years. Oh, wonderful! These are the originals, and they're 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 full size drawings. So the 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 actual uh, the the book itself is is an a is a is a uh, a a a four a a four size, which is eight and a half by eleven three quarters. Okay. So it's 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 a it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a big book, and it's a, it's you know it's like eighty four pages, and very that, good. And then and so there this is all archival stuff. I then go into and have uh, original the uh, uh, the Mega Moose drawings, a bit Mega Moose uh, 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 strips, uh, uh, Stuffy and Zoe, and then the Batman commercial. Yes, and, thank you for sharing that on Twitter. By the way, that was very fun to watch. Oh, well, I uh, yeah, the, those things they were they've been making the rounds for years now, and I didn't realize it. And then suddenly, okay, suddenly everybody sees that. You know th those those four Batman commercials that I did back in '89. So yeah, and that's um very. Uh, it reminds me, you know, everybody says to do animation, you've got to keep it as simple as possible, you know, because you don't have all these extraneous lines to keep track of. And then we see something like your Batman animation, and we see the uh, the Ruby Spears Superman cartoon, which yeah. almost looked like it was lifted off of some of the John Byrne comic books. Yeah, uh, that that just speaks to the opposite of that. It's like you know. No, if you're not lazy, you can actually do this stuff and do it yes. with detail. Yes, yes. Well, you need to draw. You have to know what you're drawing. You know, you can do. You know, you don't. You you just can't just do a doodle 
and just say, okay, this is nice because I managed to do this. Just because you've succeeded at, you, you've created something doesn't mean it can't be better. You know, it's again, it's drawing, you know, it's learning how to, you know, if you, if you have to say, well, what is this character really you know, evoking? Well, and you can't say, well, you know, what do you think it is? Well, no, a, a commercial piece of art is supposed to say, okay, what is the purpose of this art and are you successful in doing it? So with animation, it's it's a whole bunch of different things. But anyway, with the Batman commercial, uh, the, those drawings is him pointing and saying, pause off the custom of Catwoman, you know, and that is, yeah. I've done, you know, you have all the major drawings in there and you can just, scan you know just flip through it and you could see you know they're, they're the, those are the those are my roughs and so you'll see how, what everything that i consider to be important and you'll the thing about those drawings is that with that the, the animation and i do oh the other thing about uh, uh the rough sketch is i also do i have uh i write and give little stories about what happened during the time where I did those drawings. Okay. It was about, now, about being a young animator in the 1970s and 80s. Now, if somebody wants to get into animation, uh, such as our, our guest Connor wanted to do yeah. uh, tonight, um, what tools would you recommend they start with at the basic level other than a pencil and some paper? Well, I would, uh, you know, if you want, if it's if it's for the pure joy of learning, get the Preston Blair books, because okay. those are the things that I learned from. Those, the, that's that's all in a nutshell. Those Preston Blair books, in whatever form you can, show there are two books, and one is the is a very the simple one, the one that went on for that were that was being used for. 25, 30 years, and then he came up with a second one in in the late seventies, early eighties, and that one is a bit more has more technical stuff in it, and that's great too because that shows you it gives you complete master classes in that and that. So everything you need to know about the technical uh, to be able to just draw and then understand the technical aspects of what animation is, those two books. You know, I think they combined it into one now, you know, okay. so, but just to just to check those out. And uh, that's my recommendation. That. All right. Well, you, you should really you, maybe you already do this. You should do a YouTube channel and just teach classes, give these experiences out. Uh, to, yeah, uh, I have a YouTube channel and okay. I, I did that I've got I've got about uh, seven or eight uh, extensive videos with all the principles i did this before i started i decided to do you know uh get back into comic books i was saying okay what can i do for the, i want to do that and that's and so i did that that goes back about three years ago you know three or four years ago so check those 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 videos out and they're all there it's all free it's all free information the same way i have a uh, a blog John the Animator Guy. I started that in in uh, 2011, and okay. and there are you know I, I give explanations of how to use exposure sheets. You know some of the Batman drawings also showed uh, and 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 you know, a visual. I I I I write down how to handle certain things about cleanups, about uh, rough animation. Those those are things, and that's all free too. So between okay. between the YouTube video, my my John, and just just if you want to find out about me, you know, just Google John Celestri, and I'm there. You know, so you can find me anywhere. Uh, you know, and and that's all free. All so, right. Well, I'm going to find them, and I'm going to link them in the description here when I edit the video back down, uh, because as as much as as you and a lot of other people are getting into the independent comic book publishing to to save the comic book industry from its own collapse brought on by itself mm -hmm. perhaps hope above hope uh somebody will start watching your videos and read your blog and we'll see an animation revolution that will 
maybe come in and save animation from this uh, utter devastation that has befallen it. Uh, John, it has been an absolute pleasure and a, and a great educational experience to talk with you. I Thank really you. do appreciate you coming to the program. Uh, I'm definitely going to be there for Mega Moose as soon as that comes out. And I think we're going to go out and see if I can't get myself a copy of Rough Sketch just to put on the shelf here and, and uh, okay. have some have some fun looking back at the past. Well, thank, thank you, everybody, Mike. for coming. Thank oh, you for inviting and, me. And I'm going to end it right now. <laughs>